Thank you very much, Meg. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're having a great meeting so far. So um, I better do a good job here because most of the answers to the question are in this part of the talk, I think. So I guess the first question is, why do we need these CD4-6 inhibitors that we're talking about today? Well, as you know, um, about two-thirds of breast cancers are hormone receptor positive. And the classical treatments that we use to treat these cancers are aimed to either decrease estrogen levels, which is the way the aromatase inhibitors work, or block the estrogen receptor, either with tamoxifen or fulvestrant. However, as we also know, um, there are a significant number of hormone receptor positive cancers that don't benefit from hormonal therapy and actually have intrinsic resistance to these agents. And we also know that in the metastatic setting, all patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, their cancers will eventually become resistant to endocrine therapy, and that's obviously a huge issue. Now, endocrine resistance is very complex, and one of the things that has been shown is that it involves activation of growth factor pathways. And so we're talking about pathways like HER2 and EGFR and insulin growth factor receptor. They all converge on a protein called mTOR, and that is, of course, why Everalimus has been shown to be effective in hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancers and appears to, in some ways, reverse resistance to the endocrine agents. However, this still remains a huge issue, and we do need other approaches <coughs> to treat patients with these cancers. <coughs> so here's the first question you were asked. So I think you'll all remember the cell cycle from when you were training. Um, and just to remind you, there are four phases. The G1 or GAP1 phase feeds into the S phase, then the G2 phase, phase and then the M phase, the mitosis phase. And there is a G0 resting phase as well, which I'm sure you probably remember as well. So the cell cycle is highly regulated by both activators and breaks. <clears throat> and when it's properly regulated, this results in physiologic cell division, which, of course, is happening all the time in our bodies. The hallmark of cancer, of course, is loss of the cell cycle control. And that's really one of the classic things that we see with cancer cells. So where does CDK4-6 fit into this? These are the key players we're going to kind of be talking about a little bit today. So CDK stands for cyclin-dependent kinase, and the ones we're interested in are CDK4 and 6. And these are protein kinases, which, of course, there are many um, that exist in the body. But what they do is they phosphorylate cellular proteins that lead to the protein's activation or inactivation. Cyclin D1 is the regulatory subunit of CDK4-6. So it binds to activate CDK4-6 um, and, and essentially allow it to do its job of phosphorylating proteins. Now, a very key player, as you may remember, in the cell cycle is retinoblastoma, or RB protein. It's a tumor suppressor protein, and it's regulated by a group of transcription factors, which are referred to as EF2. And if you remember one slide from the mechanism of action of these drugs, this is the one to keep in mind, because this really illustrates how RB protein is controlled and how it kind of functions. So let me see which side we're on here. So on your left-hand side is the hypophosphorylated form of RB, and that's where you want RB to be, because that's when it's active. On the, the right-hand side of the screen, or your right-hand side of your screen, is the phosphorylated form. So what you want is for RB to be hypophosphorylated, which means that it's active. It then couples with its transcription factors, and that allows RB to act as a tumor suppressor, which is, of course, what we wanted to do. And this results in cell cycle arrest at G1. So remember the question was, where did we rest? And most of you got it right, it was at G1. What we don't want, and this is what's seen in cancer cells, is for RB to be phosphorylated because then it's inactive. It uncouples from its transcription factor, and this makes it no longer, a it doesn't function anymore as a tumor suppressor. So cell cycle is not arrested in G1, and the cell keeps cy cycling and cycling, which is, of course, what we see in cancer. So basically, in response to mitogenic signals, <clears throat> the phosphorylated state of RB predominates, and that's kind of where these CDK inhibitors come into being. So just remember, it, they work at, at G1. So this kind of summarizes a little bit of the way that they work. So what they do is, remember I said cyclin D1 and the CD4-6 complex is combined to activate them. What the CDK inhibitors do is they block this complex between cyclin D1 and the CDK4-6 complex. This then prevents RB protein phosphorylation. Remember, the phosphorylated RB is the, the, uh, the, the form that we don't want because it doesn't act as a tumor suppressor. So what happens then is these drugs basically stop the cell cycle from progressing from G1 through S phase, which is what we want them to do, and that in that way prevent cancer proliferation. 
And now we have a little video which would explain this much better than I did in terms of how these drugs work. Isn't it here? In order to better understand the biology of the signaling pathways and how they relate to the mechanism of action of CDK4-6 inhibitors, we have prepared some animation that illustrate these points. One approach to treating advanced estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is by targeting the cell cycle. In a healthy cell, the cell cycle is well controlled. However, in a cancer cell, the cell cycle is deregulated from mutations or upstream signals, causing cancer cells to proliferate at faster rates than healthy cells. For example, in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cells, the deregulation of the cell cycle is caused by the overexpression and overactivation of growth factor and estrogen receptor pathways. When these pathways become activated, they instigate a cascade of mitogenic signals. A wide variety of mitogenic signaling pathways converge at the level of cyclin D1 messenger RNA and protein upregulation. Cyclin D1 binds to and activates cell cycle-dependent protein kinases, or CDK, 4 and 6. The activated cyclin D1 CDK4-6 complex mediates the phosphorylation and inactivation of the tumor suppressor retinoblastoma protein. In a normal state, activated RB protein inhibits the cell cycle from progressing through the G1 phase. The phosphorylation of the RB, or retinoblastoma protein, releases E2F transcription factors from the protein complex causing the cell cycle to progress from G1 to S phase and resulting in cancer cell proliferation. There are three selective ATP competitive inhibitors that have been developed to target the cyclin D1 CDK4-6 complex. These small molecule inhibitors block the cyclin D1 CDK4-6 complex and prevent the phosphorylation of RB protein. This stops the cell cycle from progressing to the S phase, preventing cell cancer proliferation or growth. In addition to causing transient G1 cell cycle arrest, preclinical evidence suggests that these inhibitors can also cause senescence and apoptosis. Targeting the cell cycle with CDK4-6 inhibitors is a promising treatment option for patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer. You get the next one. Um, so as you saw in the video, these are the three CDK4-6 inhibitors that are currently either available or in development. Palbocyclob, we'll talk quite a bit about, as you know, has two FDA approvals currently. And then in development are ribocyclob, which is a drug that Novartis has developed, which is, as we're going to show you, is in phase three studies. And then abemocyclob is a Lilly drug, which actually is in phase two and phase three studies as well. And there will be some data from this at ASCO this year, which we'll, we'll mention later on. So um, as far as palbocyclob, where did it first come from? Well, um, one of the interesting things about this drug is when they started looking at it preclinically, you know, they didn't really have any idea which particular type of breast cancer this drug would be effective on. But what they found was that palbocyclob is only effective in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So cell lines that had a luminal feature, they were the ones that benefited from palbocyclob. And that's been borne out because one of the questions you probably ask is, well, if this drug is effective in ER positive breast cancer, how would it be in ER negative breast cancer? And there have been some trials done, but unfortunately they haven't been very promising. So that's why we're, it's focused on hormone receptor positive disease. So the first clinical trial that, uh, that was presented was Paloma 1. There's a series of Paloma trials, um, two of which have been uh, pr presented so far. And Paloma 1 was a randomized phase 2 study of postmenopausal patients uh, who were treated in the first line setting for hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. And you can see it was 165 patients recruited to the study. And they were randomized in an open label fashion to either letrozole or letrozole plus palbocyclob. And as I think you probably all know, palbocyclob is given at a dose of 125 milligrams daily for three weeks with the, the, the last week off, which could be a little problematic because the letrozole is continuous, but I haven't really noticed that most patients seem to be able to, to keep on track with it. Now, the other thing about this study was when they were doing the preclinical work with this drug, there was some suggestion that tumors that had amplification of CCND1 or cyclin D1 um, and our loss of P16 
would be particularly sensitive to palbociclib. So the trial was done in two parts, where the first part, they just allowed any patient in the first line setting with hormone receptor positive metastatic disease to go on the trial. And then in part two, they enriched the, 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 uh, the clinical trial for patients with tumors that had either CCND1 amplification and or loss of P12, or sorry, P16. So here are the results shown here. So there was quite a marked advantage for the addition of palbocyclic electrolyte, as you can see shown here, with an improvement when you took both parts one and two together of a progression-free survival of 10 months in the letrozole arm and 20 months in the palbocyclic letrozole arm. And you can see the hazard ratio is about 50, point, or about 0.49 or so, clearly statistically significant. So what this reflects is a doubling of progression-free survival with the addition of palbocyclic letrozole, which was one of the questions you were asked. Now, if you look at the individual parts of this study, um, there was a benefit for the addition of palbocyclopiletrazole, whether you just looked at hormone receptor positive breast cancers or without any selection, but also for the tumors that were hormone receptor positive and had the CCND1 and our P16 loss. Um, it didn't appear that this was a really good biomarker for palbocyclob, so this was not used in future trials as a selection process going forward. And the other thing I always say about these is one of the important things to look at when you see these hormone receptor positive trials is always look at the control arm because that tells you what patients you're actually recruiting onto the trial. So generally the rule is if the median progression-free survival is less than six months, it tends to be a more hormone refractory group of cancers. If it's above six months, it tends to be more hormone sensitive with some hormone refractory cancers. So you can see here that many of these patients did appear to have hormone sensitive cancers. <coughs> So these results are obviously very impressive and they led to the approval of this drug. But I think one of the niggling questions out there is, well, does everybody need palbocyclob in the first line setting? Or are there patients that we could just treat with endocrine therapy? Because as I think you'd all agree, it's a little bit more cumbersome when you, you add palbocyclob in. The other endpoints were uh, partial response rate, as you can see, which was improved. And if you look at the clinical benefit rate that includes stable disease and response rate, it was 58% for letrozole and 81% for palbocyclob and letrozole. <clears throat> now, we'll talk quite a bit about side effects later on, but as you all know, the issue with this drug is neutropenia and leukopenia. You can see here that about 50% of patients had grade 3 or 4 neutropenia on the study, 20% had leukopenia, but the important thing was there was no case of febrile neutropenia or neutropenia-related infections described. Now, I will say there is a description of infections with this drug which are not related to neutropenia, which have been seen. Um, they're very rare, but so it's just important to tell your patients to call if they have fevers. Um, the other side effects really were uh, pretty rare and uh, really weren't different between the two arms, but you can see them shown here. And the other thing that's important is when you look at the patient discontinuation rate, it was 13% on the palbocyclob and letrozole arm versus 2% on letrozole alone. And that was probably because they had to come off the drug because they were doing very routine blood monitoring, CBC monitoring on the study. It was less likely because the patient themselves wanted to come off because of side effects. Now, <clears throat> last year at ASCO, we got the results of Paloma 3, which was an important study because it's looking at palbocyclob in a more hormone-resistant uh, tumor population. Um, so this was a phase three, so it's larger than Paloma 1, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study where they took patients with any menopausal status, you would assume, of course, the premenopausal patients probably had ovarian suppression added in. And uh, they all had hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. But the difference, difference between this study and Paloma 1 is that they all had prior endocrine therapy. So this is the same population that was enrolled in, so the Bolero 2 study that looked at Everolimus, for, for example. <clears throat> and they were randomized to um, fulvustrant, either with palbocyclob or with placebo. The fulvustrant was given at the, the now standard dose, which is the 500 milligrams every four weeks with a loading dose, and the palbocyclob was given at the same dosage that we showed you in the Paloma 1 study. <clears throat> and again, <clears throat> very impressive results from this study as well. The progression-free survival was improved from four months in the control arm up to 9.5 months in the, uh, the palbocyclob arm. You see, it was actually a two-to-one randomization. Um, and uh, again, this is a doubling in progression-free survival with the addition of palbocyclob to fulvustrant. And this illustrates that this drug is effective in hormone-resistant cancers because you can see here that the progression-free survival was less than six months on the control arm. 
and the response rate was also improved. As you know, with these target agents, responses are not that common. So that's why you really have to emphasize to your patient that disease control is kind of what this is, this is what we're looking for. Um, the side effects on this were exactly what we saw in the other study. Um, the rate of neutropenia was a little bit higher. You can see 81% on this study, and also the leukopenia. I'm not really sure why that was. Um, uh, it may have been because they'd had more prior treatment, and I, I don't have a good ex explanation for this. But again, there was no difference in febrile neutropenia between the two arms of the study. And the patient discontinuation rate was very low, as you can see, only 4% on the study arm. So as far as what's going, what, the other things that are ongoing with palbocyclob, Paloma 2 is the phase 3 confirmatory study of Paloma 1. So it's a first-line study with letrozole, with or without palbocyclob, um, again, postmenopausal patients. What we know is that Pfizer just had a press release, I think this week or last week, where it's basically showing that it met its primary endpoint. So that will be presented at ASCO, I'm sure, um, in a few weeks. <clears throat> the PEARL study is interesting. So it's basically comparing exemestane plus palbocyclob with kepcitabine in patients with hormone receptor positive advanced breast cancer <clears throat> who have what is proposed to be uh, aromatase inhibitor resistant disease. It's kind of an interesting design, but one of the things certainly that's happened with Everolimus was what would you end up with when these targeted agents have toxicities, it's important to make sure that the toxicities aren't really worse than what you see with chemotherapy, and that's kind of the basis of these type of trials, comparing um, an endocrine therapy plus targeted approach with chemotherapy. Um, I think a lot of times the FDA makes the companies do this because I think most patients would prefer to be on a more logical treatment with the, actually targeting their cancer rather than just getting chemotherapy. And then the early stage study uh, setting, just two studies to mention. Penelope B trial is looking at patients who've had preoperative chemotherapy, who have residual disease, which a lot of patients with hormone receptor positive disease do following preoperative chemotherapy. And <clears throat> they are treated with palbocyclob, sorry, palbocyclob in addition to endocrine therapy following their chemotherapy and surgery. And then Palace has recently opened, it is recruiting. This is an early stage study, basically looking at the addition of palbocyclob to endocrine therapy in patients with early stage hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. <clears throat> and just to mention, we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, um, the initial starting dose is 125 milligrams per day. What's recommended is you, that you do a CBC on day one. Also recommended to do a CBC on day 14 or 15 of the first and second cycle. A lot of people aren't really that interested in doing that midway one. It's kind of going a little bit out of vogue, even though it is in the package insert, just because we know that they're probably going to have some neutropenia, and you're going to adjust your dosage probably on the day one CBC rather than the day 15 DB CBC. So I think we should follow the package insert, but I know some people are a little bit less aggressive about doing CBCs for these patients. And then the dose modifications are 100 milligrams, the first dose, second dose 75, and really no point in giving below 75. <clears throat> Moving on to abemacyclob, which is the, the Lily drug, um, another very interesting drug. All we have from this is a phase 1b trial, which was a little bit complicated in its design, but basically it was hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer, HER2 positive or HER2 negative, and they were looking at different doses of abemacyclob, which is given every 12 hours, either with one of the non steroidal aromatase inhibitors, with tamoxifen, with eczemestane, Exemestine Everolimus or Everolimus alone, and even with Transtuzumab. So it's a small study with just really looking at safety more than anything else. Um, and here's the results, and <clears throat> I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because there's really no, no major difference between the arms. But what they noted was, was the addition of a benocyclob to either the endocrine therapies alone or the endocrine therapies with Everolimus appeared to add some advantage. Um, and they, this allowed them to work out the dose. This drug is given on a continuous a schedule rather than the three out of four week schedule that palbocyclob has. So the results really show that you could achieve the concentrations with the, the dosing that they were giving. Uh, given um, they didn't see evidence of drug-drug interactions. It has a slightly different um, side effect profile compared to palbocyclob in that it has less effect on the neutrophils and um, white blood cell counts. But the side effect with this drug is diarrhea, which is usually manageable, but that's the one. I don't know if anybody's given it, but that's the one thing you do see. Um, and also some fatigue has been described as well. Although I'm a little bit skeptical of these because these patients were probably quite heavily pretreated, so it's hard to kind of know whether the drug was calling, causing fatigue or the, or the disease. So the abemacyclob studies are called the monarch studies. 
Um, the, this is the only one of the CDK inhibitors that appears to have single agent activity, and Monarch 1 will be presented at ASCO, and it's just basically evaluating in a phase two trial single agent of benocyclob without endocrine therapy in previously treated homoreceptor positive HER2 advanced breast cancer, HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. That's on Friday morning. <clears throat> Monarch 2 is like Paloma 3, so it's pre-treated patients of benocyclob uh, with fulvustrin or fulvustrin alone. And Monarch 3 then is, a, <coughs> is basically looking at the first line setting with a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor with or without a benocyclob. <coughs> and then as far as ribocyclob, which is the Novartis drug, we don't have any data yet, but there are three uh, Mona Lisa studies know where they get these names from, that are currently uh, re recruiting. Uh, so Mon Mona Lisa 2 is the first line setting, letrozole with or without ribocyclob. Mona Lisa 3 is the pre-treated setting, looking at uh, full restaurant with or without the CDK inhibitor. And then Mona Lisa 7 is actually interesting because it's actually focused in premenopausal patients, which we almost never see uh, trials in. So premenopausal patients all get uh, ovarian suppression with tamoxifen or a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor, and then get ran randomized to ribocyclob or not. I think that is my last slide, so I'll head it back over to Meg.